Let's talk about compound names and formulas. Get out your science notebook. Here's the essential question. How do we write the names and formulas of ionic, covalent, and metallic compounds? Well, before we do that, let's have a quick reminder or review of things we've talked about so far. Remember, ionic compounds are between metals and nonmetals. And when they bond, they transfer electrons. By doing so, a consequence is that of that is that they form ions or they become charged. So here's an example that we've seen before, lithium fluoride. Lithium is a metal, fluorine is a nonmetal. They're going to transfer electrons to get their full valence shell, and they're going to become charged, oppositely charged. Lithium loses an electron, becoming positive charge, and fluorine gains a negatively charged electron, becoming negative charge, and then they stick together. Covalent compounds, on the other hand, are only made out of nonmetals. When we see those compounds, we know that they're going to share electrons. Now, they don't have to share fairly. Polar bonds are unequal sharing of electrons, and nonpolar bonds are where they share electrons evenly. Water is an example of a polar covalent molecule. We know it's going to share electrons. It's made out of hydrogens and oxygens, or hydrogens and two hydrogens and one oxygen, and they share their electrons. The last is a metallic bonds. Metallics are metals only. And they're made, they form bonds by having a sea of electrons, kind of like you see here with silver. All right, this is a good time to get out your science foldable. We're going to go ahead and add two, the last two rows of our science foldable. We've already done this in a previous notes um, where we talked about made between properties and valence electrons. Now let's talk about naming and chemical formulas. Go ahead and flip open the naming section for each of your compounds. We're going to go ahead and add a little bit of naming rules for each. Let's start with ionic compounds. Ionic compounds, we always name them by naming the metal first and then the nonmetal second. And we always end the name, the compound name, in ide. An example that we saw earlier is lithium fluoride. Remember, that's a single compound made of lithium and fluorine stuck together. Now, a quick tip that that's going to make sense a little bit later when we talk about covalent compounds, but notice that in ionic compounds, the amounts are not shown in the name. Lithium and fluorine don't tell you how many there are, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Let's contrast that to covalent compounds. In a covalent compound, we always name the top leftmost periodic table nonmetal first. Just remember, we read left to right, top to bottom, so we always use the top leftmost one first. And then we just do the next nonmetal next. We always use prefix in covalent compounds, and that tells us how many of each nonmetal are in that compound. Here's the list of prefix. You can go ahead and write this on your foldable. I might put it at the top part of the flap, but you can also find this on your periodic table on the back. Lastly, we end covalent compounds with the name ide. A great example of this is carbon dioxide. So notice it's one carbon, and then di is the prefix for two for oxygens, because there's two oxygens in carbon dioxide. Notice that carbon also does not include mono. We never use that for the first element if it's there for one. Uh, sometimes we use it for the second, and sometimes not at all. Last is metallic. Pretty simple. Just use the metal's name. For example, silver. We just call it silver metal. And that's about it. So let's do some student practice. Take a look at these compounds here. Now, remember, each compound has a different naming rule depending if it's ionic, covalent, or metallic. So the very first thing we should do is recognize whether each are ionic, covalent, or metallic. The first one, CO2, this one is covalent because it's only made out of nonmetals. This one is just a single metal. It's silver, so this is just a metallic bond. MgO, this is a metal, magnesium, and oxygen, a nonmetal. So if I have a metal and a nonmetal, it's ionic. The rest of them, again, follow those rules. Potassium and sulfur, that's a metal and a nonmetal, it's ionic. Ag, that's just a single metal, so that's metallic. P and O, so P3O5, that's two nonmetals, that's covalent. Al2O3, aluminum is a metal, oxygen is a nonmetal, that's ionic. And then SF6, sulfur and fluorine are both nonmetals, so that means that this is a covalent compound. Now that we know what types of bonds these are made, we can follow the naming rules for each because they're slightly different. The first one's the covalent compound, and we saw it before, but just a reminder that covalent compounds use a prefix. Only covalent compounds use a prefix, so CO2 is carbon dioxide. Carbon, one carbon, and then two oxygens, so di for the two, that's the prefix, and then we end it in ide. Next is a metallic bond. So we do not use those prefix. We just basically name the metal. It's gold. 
Next is ionic. We don't use the prefix here. We just name the metal first, then the nonmetal, and end in ide. So this is going to be magnesium oxide. Another ionic, K2S, this is simple, so we're just going to name this potassium sulfide. Again, notice that neither ionic compound tell us how many are in the name. Uh, we know that from the formula, but we don't use prefix in the name. Ag is silver. P3O5 is covalent, so we need to use the prefix up top. P3, 3 is tri as a prefix, so that's triphosphorus, and then 5 is penta, so pentaoxide. Next is ionic. We do not use prefix. It's aluminum and oxygen again. So this is Al2O3. That's aluminum oxide. And then the last is covalent SF6. That's sulfur hexafluoride. All right. Now that we know how to name formulas, let's go ahead and use those names to write their actual chemical formulas. For ionic, this is a little bit complicated, but we'll make sure you know how to do it. We're going to use the predictable charges found on the periodic table and then we combine elements following the rule of zero charge. Now that seems a little complicated, and I'll help you out with lots of practice, but here's one example that you might want to add in your foldable. How about calcium fluoride? So calcium fluoride is a compound made from calcium and fluorine. If you look on the periodic table, calcium is a plus two charge. That's the charge it predictably becomes when it makes an ionic bond. And fluorine predictably becomes minus one charge. We learned about this earlier when we talked about ions and whether elements will give or take electrons. And this is what they usually become after they either give. So calcium usually gives two electrons, losing two negative charges, becoming positive, And fluorine usually takes one electron, becoming a negative. So if we look at those charges, we can combine them to follow the rule of zero charge. What that means is we need enough of each in order to combine them to cancel each other out. In this case, we would need one calcium and two fluorines in order for them to cancel each other out. So this formula for calcium fluoride is CaF2. So that's how we use the charges and the rule of zero charge to figure out how to write the formula for that compound. All right, covalent compounds, they're really easy compared to ionic. We remember those prefix. Well, the name tells us how many are in the compound. So for example, di-nitrogen monoxide, di is two, mono is one. So there's two nitrogens and one oxygen. But when we write the formula, we usually use it like this. Notice we don't write ones in the formula, it's implied there. We also may not need to use mono as a prefix. We could also call this di-nitrogen oxide. All right, last is metallic. We just write the element symbol. It's no more complicated than that. So copper metal would just be Cu. All right, so we talked about those predictable charges. In case you missed it on your periodic table, I wanted to point them out. Each of these charges are written and they are predictable charges only for when these elements bond ionically. So remember, these aren't the charges the elements are always. They're just the charges they typically become when they bond in an ionic bond. And we know this just because of how many valence electrons they either lose if they're metals or gain if they're nonmetals. Now, on your periodic table, if elements don't have a written charge, that means they probably have more than one charge and they're not very predictable. All these that are circled here are the ones that are predictable. Now, if they're written at the top of the column, the entire column includes that charge. Again, that's the predictable charge they become only when they're bonding ionically. All right, so let's do some practice. Now, just so you know, I've taken out all the metallic bonds here. Metallic bonds are really simple. We're just going to focus on the ionic and the covalent. So let's start with calcium chloride. Again, in order to do anything with these, we need to know whether it's making an ionic bond or a covalent bond. So calcium chloride is ionic. Calcium is a metal. Chlorine's a nonmetal. Now, this is going to tell us how to combine the two together. Remember, ionic bonds use the predictable charges from the periodic table. So if you don't have your periodic table out, you might want to get it out to find these charges. Calcium likes to make a positive two charge, and chlorine likes to make a minus one charge when they bond in an ionic bond. So let's use that rule of zero charge. How many of each element would you need in order to cancel each other out? Well, in this case, we would need two chlorines. So I'm going to put the formula together with one calcium, so Ca, and then two chlorines, Cl, with a little subscript 2. This right here is the formula for calcium chloride. So the name calcium chloride is a compound, and this is the formula. We had to do a little bit of work to figure that out. 
Well, let's try it again. This time, let's do it with magnesium phosphide. Again, magnesium phosphide is ionic. So we have to follow the rule of zero charge. We have to know what the charges of the elements are on the periodic table. So I pull out my periodic table. I look at the predictable charges. Magnesium likes to make a plus two. It's actually in the same column as calcium. Phosphorus, on the other hand, likes to make a minus three charge. So here's the tricky question. How many of each of these elements would you need in order for each to cancel out? Well, I know that the common denominator both of them go into is six. So how many would I need? How many magnesiums would I need to get six? Well, I would need three magnesiums plus two plus two plus two plus two. That's six. How about phosphorus? Well, I would only need two phosphoruses to get to six. So that's my formula, Mg3P2. So magnesium phosphide, the name. The formula is Mg3P2. That's the compound of magnesium phosphide. All right, pentanitrogen oxide. This one is covalent. Nitrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals, so they don't apply that rule of zero charge. Instead, we figured out using the prefix penta, and then notice it's just oxide, so that's just one of them. So there's five nitrogen, penta, and one oxygen. So I'm just going to write that as a formula, N5O. All right, phosphorus tribromide. Do you know if this is ionic or covalent? If you said covalent, you'd be correct because it's phosphorus and bromine, which are both nonmetals. So we use those prefix. Phosphorus is only one. There's no prefix there. So we're just going to put one of them. But tri for bromine means three. So there's one phosphorus and three bromines. If we write that together as a compound, so they're attached, it's PBr3. Dichlorine heptoxide, that's also covalent. Di means two, so two chlorines. And hept is the prefix for seven, so there's seven oxygens, Cl2O7. All right, last one is potassium phosphide. This one is ionic, so we need to worry about the rule of zero charge. So we need to go look at what the predictable charges of these elements are. Potassium likes to make a plus one, and phosphorus likes to make a minus three. So how many of each would we need for them to cancel out? Well, we would need three potassiums, each equal plus one. So plus one, plus one, plus one, that's a plus three. Now phosphorus, we only need one of them because it's a minus three, so it cancels out the three potassiums. All right, that's the end of the notes. We'll see you guys later.